Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about how we can use uh, proxies such as bivalve geochemistry um, to help guide um, management and, and characterization of, of wetlands such as the Kurung lagoons. Um, so I'm sure you all know where the Kurung is, um, moving down the basin a little bit from what we've heard this morning. Um, uh, but it is uh, obviously a very uh, important wetland, both uh, ecologically and uh, culturally. Um, and it uh, represents, uh, from an ecological point of view, a very interesting uh, mixing of fresh water, uh, salt water, um, and, and lots of different processes going on there. Um, and uh, so, yeah, but it has been uh, managed um, pretty much since European arrival um, uh, with uh, structures such as barrages and, and, um, and uh, management processes like drainage in the southeast um, and that means um, from our point of view we don't really have a, a detailed instrumental record um, from prior to European um, management of this system um, and that has some implications that I'll talk about soon. Um, yeah, but the, uh, so we did see Obviously, we had uh, the millennium drought quite recently, um, and this was a, a very big event and um, got lots of media, and it became a big talking point. Um, and uh, there was uh, seen a few graphs of this this morning, but um, the, the flows um, during this time were uh, very, very low. Um, but looking back into the past, um, What's significant about them is, is just the, the period of time that we had low flows for. Um, and uh, that got a lot of people thinking about whether this was uh, sort of natural in the uh, context of the Kurong um, and its history. Um, and uh, lots of questions flying around um, involving the management and, and whether uh, how we manage it will be enough to recover the system back to um, what it once was. Um, so when we're talking about um, the management and the baselines, um, yeah, under the Ramsar Convention, um, it does have an ecological character, um, and this was characterised uh, when it was uh, added to the convention in, in the mid-80s, um, and it was characterised as a saline to hypersaline lagoon, um, and that was based on, on, on these... Uh, drivers and um, levers here um, that uh, are both natural, um, such as climate and hydrology, um, combined with more anthropogenic um, levers, um, things that we've put in place to regulate or drain or um, barrage water. Um, and these have impacts on um, components and processes, which in turn um, uh, have uh, benefits and services to the ecosystem. Um, and whether these uh, characterizations um, and the following limits of change um, associated with that are uh, based on what is considered a natural, um, natural state for this ecosystem uh, is questionable. Um, and there's been a bit of research lately um, that perhaps indicates that these uh, uh, this uh, baseline um, was is based on a system that was already degraded in the 80s. Uh, so there's been uh, some research um, done, a uh, number of proxies. Uh, I've just shown a graph here from David McCurdy um, and others from Adelaide uh, who did a chemical uh, analysis of some sediments in the Kurong. Um, and uh, what you can see here is um, from uh, in sort of recent times, there is a real uh, deviation from um, the rest of the record um, going back um, almost to the start of the Kurong, 7,000 years or so. Uh, and um, this is consistent with other evidence um, from uh, studies in we're using diatoms and ostracods and forearms and sediments and et cetera um, that have all um, seemed to conclude that the recent conditions are a departure from uh, what in, we would consider a natural baseline state. 
Uh, and so what I'm uh, working on um, in this project is using um, bivalve geochemistry to analyze this as well. Um, so the yeah, bivalves are, are useful because they grow um, in, uh, in, um, in response to the uh, waters uh, and the chemistry and physical, physical and chemi uh, chemical properties of the waters. Um, and so they can record um, things like temperature, salinity, um, pollution, um, like cycling and all sorts of things. Um, and they are, uh, can be used to um, create quite long, long records um, that can uh, predate uh, the uh, industrial baseline or an industrial like effect on on the environment, um, and so we can analyse whether um, the present or recent time um, is different from our um, pre-industrial baselines. Uh, shells can, um, some shells live for very long times and can individually provide quite a, a long record. So the longest lived shell I think was just over 500 years old, but um, which made it the longest single organism, longest lived single organism, but unfortunately they had to kill it to find that out. Um, <laughs> but they, so who knows, it may, it may have lived for much longer, but um, that shell went into a record um, which uh, uh, many um, individuals of that species um, were pieced together to, to um, create a, a record of climate variability from 649 AD, which is quite a, a long record for the one species. Um, and so these, um, these sorts of studies can, can be useful for uh, many sort of ecological and um, uh, studies, um, but for us, um, we're really looking at um, these baselines um, before um, these uh, management processes in the Kurong. Um, like I said, it's, it's useful, these uh, bivalve geochemical proxies, quite useful for uh, uh, lots of different users. Um, I know there's like mining companies around the world using it to trace their um, pollution in the waters that run off and, um, and things like that, but uh, it's also got a, quite a big use in conservation and, and regulation. Um, and uh, there's lots of different um, sort of uh, indexes that you can measure. Uh, through bivalve geochemistry, um, but for us, we're uh, using um, uh, proxies to look at temperature, uh, salinity, water changes, and then in the long term, uh, long term sort of seasonal changes through long term um, climate change in the Kurong. Um, and there's lots of different ways to measure this as well. Um, but we're using s traditional stable isotopes and trace elements as well. Um, and I've just got a couple of examples here of uh, other people's work um, using shell uh, chemistries to trace. Uh, both of these are temperatures. Um, so this is an oyster from uh, Sydney um, uh, that the, in one individual shell um, has traced uh, the temperature here through its lifetimes and number of days um, tested. Um, you can test these um, trace elemental proxies on a very high resolution um, scale so we can get um, annual or sub-annual seasonal signals out of a single shell. Um, and similarly down here, um, this is an individual shell as well um, with a sea surface temperature record um, and the oxygen isotopes um, recording temperature in that shell as well in that environment. Um, the species that we are looking at um, from the Kurong is this tiny micromollusk called Arthritica helmsi. Um, the scale bar is really small, um, so that says three millimetres. So these shells are usually around two millimetres big, so they're really tiny. Um, probably really easy to miss if you're down there, but they uh, like make up quite a lot of the sort of sandy, beachy parts of the Kurong. Um, and uh, they generally, they live for about a year, um, but they are very abundant in both um, some areas of the Kurong in the modern system and in the sedimentary record as well. So we have sediment cores um, 
from along Bupurong, and, and there's one here, um, Ko Aitin, just at the top of the South Lagoon, um, and it is uh, pretty chock-a-block full of shells. So uh, this picture is not great either, but all of these little um, sort of little variations in colour, um, they're just individual shells packed into the um, sediment core. So we have lots and lots of material to work with, which is which is great and quite unusual. Um, quite lucky to have found that. Um, and so what we've been doing um, recently is looking at their modern chemistries um, and, and trying to relate that to modern um, water chemistry. And uh, that's necessary because even in um, all of these sort of relationships between different species differ, so it's, it's um, necessary to go through um, modern systems and calibrate your species to an environment before you go back into the past and try to um, try to make in, um, interpretations of paleo data. Uh, so these stars here um, just show up uh, five sites we've been collecting the shells from uh, for the last year. Um, we collect water samples uh, monthly and then the shells every three months or so just to give them time to grow a little bit more. Um, and uh, the reason they're all up sort of at the northern end of the North Lagoon. Oh, wow, it's going pretty quick. Um, uh, and that's just um, their salinity preference at the moment is, is that's where they're living. Um, we don't find any living ones down here anymore. It's way too salty for them down there. Uh, so I'll get into a little bit of data. Um, this is uh, some water isotope data. Um, and uh, basically it implies that the Kurong is an evaporator system, which is what we would expect um, of the system. Um, and it, it has a, a similar slope um, to the Darling River system, um, different intercept, but that's due to the Darling being uh, more inland and the Kurong being coastal. Um, but yeah, so it indicates that the Kurong is evaporative, which we would guess anyway. Um, but yeah, and then the... Um, Oxygen isotope values of the water as well, um, we found have quite a good relationship with conductivity. Um, again, uh, uh, interpreted that as um, the water's, uh, the oxygen isotope values are driven by evaporation and water mixing um, more so than temperature. Um, and then lastly, um, just to get through this quickly, the stable isotopes. Um, I don't have any of the modern shell isotopes at the moment to show you, but um, this is a record from that core um, 18 dating back um, just over two and a half thousand years. Um, and it shows sort of variable um, periods um, through time, um, uh, which um, of the higher values sort of uh, relate to increased evaporation or marine inflow, um, and then the lower values um, reduce evaporation or um, freshwater inflow. Um, and when we analyse these modern shells that we've been collecting, um, we'll be able to assess whether um, these modern shells fall into the range of variability shown throughout um, this time um, from the core. Um, so uh, just to finish off, um, uh, it's, uh, we have to maintain the ecological character of the, the Kurong, but um, it's sort of hard to determine what that is without these kinds of records. Um, Bivalve geochemistry um, can provide um, some quantitative records um, of hydrological variability, um, and this may help uh, some of you in management um, to guide um, management targets and, and policy surrounding that. Oops. Thanks.